In this film I want to talk about the John Carpenter film Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. As with all the other movie and TV reviews on this channel it does contain spoilers so if you haven't seen Halloween 3 go stream or buy the DVD then come back and watch this. But I think it would be definitely worth watching the film before you watch this analysis. Halloween 3 is different than the previous films in the series that has nothing to do with Michael Myers, hence the subtitle season of The Witch. The film was to cash in on the series, created successfully by John Carpenter in the late 70s and early 80s, but the story bore no relation to the Michael Myers element which drove the success of the previous two films. It was the least successful financially of the three Halloween series films, but was still a box office hit. The story can be construed as again an attack on paganism and in some ways it is, it's definitely from that viewpoint and it's not the first time this has been brought into films and TV which I'll explain shortly. From the point of view of this channel in terms of an occult analysis in terms of philosophy it does contain many important elements that were foreshadowing the world that we live in today. The film does at times straddle the world between science fiction and horror and I think this is what gives it something of an understated Lovecraftian feel which also adds to its power. The film is very entertaining and it's a great watch and it definitely comes from the genre of the video nasties, those VHS and Betamax films of the early 1980s. But having said that, it is hardly bereft of an excellent storyline and the violence only adds to the narrative rather than being gratuitous. The film takes place in the early 80s about a week before Halloween in Northern California where a shop owner called Harry Grimbridge is being chased along a road by these men in suits. He gets as far as a petrol station and he's holding a jack-of-lantern mask. He's then driven by the gas station attendant to a nearby hospital and he's placed in the care of Dr. Dan Chalice, dedicated doctor but going through a lot of difficulty in his private life as his marriage is failing. While he's under the care of Dr. Chalice, another man in a suit enters Grimbridge's hospital room and murders him. Then, in front of everyone, sets himself on fire and burns himself alive. Following this, Dan is left disturbed and he eventually meets up with his daughter, Ellie, at a nearby bar and he tells her about the strange events surrounding the murder of her father and the self-immolation of the man. He also shows her the mask that her father was holding at the time he was admitted to hospital. Determined to find out the source of the mask and what caused this great fear in her father, Ellie, along with Dan, have discovered that the mask is built by a company called Silver Shamrock Novelties, which are based in the town of Santa Mira, again in Northern California. They drive to the town seeking answers as to why this mask had such a profound effect and ultimately led to the death of Ellie's father. While in the town, they discover it's a classic company town and everyone in the town works for or is controlled by a Conal Cochran, played brilliantly by Dan O'Hurley, who's the owner of Silver Shamrock. They produced Jack O' Lantern and Witch and Skeleton Nest for Halloween, and they brought great prosperity to the town. The Cochrans had emigrated from Ireland and set up a successful business in Santa Mira. While he was signing into the motel register, Dan discovers that Harry had stayed in the same hotel. There was also two other guests there. One was a shop owner called Marge Gutman and a family, the Cuffers, with their son who's just called Little Buddy, visiting the factory on business. While she is in her hotel room, Miss Gutman finds a microchip on the back of the silver shamrock button connected on the mask. She starts playing around with it with a hairpin and it discharges a laser beam into her face and removes most of her skin, killing her instantly. Dan and Ellie find out about the accident and Dan being a doctor naturally wants to help but he's forced away by a group of men similar to the ones who had chased Harry at the beginning of the movie. This is the first time he meets Colonel Cochrane and Cochrane assures him that they have the best hospital facilities at the factory and that she'll get the best care and there's nothing to worry about, he doesn't have to get involved. That next morning, Dan and Ellie take a tour of the factory with the Kupfers and discover that Harry's car is still there, guarded by more men dressed in suits. 
having returned to the motel, they cannot contact anyone outside the town as all the phone lines have been shut down and while Dan is attempting to alert the authorities that there's possibly a foul play involved in the initial chase that led to Harry Grimbridge's murder. Then Ellie mysteriously disappears and Dan is captured by the men in suits only to discover that they're androids or automatons which have been created by the Cochrane. Cochrane then reveals his plan to sacrifice the children of America who are wearing his masks on Halloween. Resurrecting of the ancient sound witchcraft at 9pm during the big giveaway on all TV channels following the horrorthon. As would happen with Miss Goodman, each of the masks contains a small piece of the Stonehenge monument which is connected to an electronic circuit when activated by the flashing signal of the TV commercial's on-screen magic pumpkin. The microchip then fires this laser beam into the skull of the wearer, killing the child instantly and then snakes and other poisonous animals come out of the child's skull and kill anyone nearby. Cochrane brutally and calmly demonstrates this by killing the Kupfer family in this way. In order to kill Dan during the ritual, Cochrane puts a silver shamrock mask on Dan and leaves him there to die during the 9 o'clock ritual. He manages struggles free and destroys the television and then removes his mask and he escapes through a ventilation shaft and rescues who he believes to be Ellie. During the pursuit and before the beginning of the ritual he dumps a box containing dozens of the buttons that are on the masks from an overhead gantry and this causes the signal to activate using the stones from Stonehenge that have been stolen killing Cochrane's employees and then Cochrane himself with a smile on his face is vaporized by the Stonehenge stone he used to create the mask. The entire Silver Shamrock factory is then destroyed as Dan and Ellie escape. As they're driving away, Ellie begins to attack Dan, revealing herself as not the real Ellie. The real Ellie has been killed and has been replaced by a robot or mannequin automaton duplicate. The car crashes and he decapitates Ellie's android with an iron bar. Walking to a nearby petrol station, attempting to contact the station managers to switch off all the TV stations before they show the 9 o'clock commercial. Just at that point, a group of trick-or-treaters wearing silver shamrock masks arrive at the station to participate in the big giveaway. Dan persuades the stations to take all the channels off 1 and 2, but not channel 3 where the commercial keeps playing. Right into the start of the magic pumpkin sequence. The final scene is Dan screaming on the phone. To turn off the commercial and then the animated pumpkin head flashes in front of him and the children a fantastic ending to a very very entertaining film this idea of ancient stones of britain and ireland being used to for nefarious or demonic or alien purposes was hardly new by this stage prior to this we had the brilliant british tv show children of the stones broadcast in the mid late 70s and following this in 1979 we had Nigel Keneal who wrote The Magnificent Quatermass 3 starring Sir John Mills again about the idea of aliens harvesting humans through the stone circles of Britain. John Carpenter employed Nigel Keneal to write the storyline for Halloween 3. What makes the film fantastic is that it foreshadows in many ways the world we live in today. The Cochrane family through their Silver Shamrock novelties have complete and total control over the Northern California town. Every aspect of their lives from their jobs, employment to the commerce of the town right through to even healthcare is controlled by this one large corporation as we see today. The town is completely under surveillance by CCTV cameras 24 hours a day. Nobody has any freedom. It is very much the world we live in today being predicted back in 1982. There's also the element of transhumanism in that the workers and the security in the factory, many of them being made up of androids, extremely realistic human looking robots and in fact Dan has sex with Ellie and later on she's replaced by Clay's host to the idea that maybe he was foreshadowing the sex robot. Was Ellie an android all along? While it's very easy to sit there and say that the film mocks paganism and mocks our ancient ancestors' connection to stones, at the same time too, it indirectly, through Keneal's writing, 
also shows that there is an inherent power in these stones. What we're given an insight into is the Christian fear of the ancient magic and witchcraft, not only pertaining to the stone circles in places such as Stonehenge. This is why we had the stone killers in places like Scotland in the 1600s pouring acid and trying attempting to dynamite stones, believing that they were frozen devils but also the general fear of witchcraft. Ultimately, this is what Cochrane was attempting. And what made this even more profound was that Cochrane's amalgamation of witchcraft with technology, modern digital technology, was especially profound for those times. It was almost on many levels a begrudging acknowledgement that the ancient stone circles themselves were a form of high technology that was used in a different way. There's very little of any proof there was ever mass sacrifices took place in the pagan world. Nicely plays into the idea that we were all murderous savages before Christianity was brought over to Europe. Nevertheless, from an occult point of view, what really gives power to the movie Halloween 3 Season of the Witch is not this element of the continuing sinister enforcing reference of paganism and ancient stone circles, but is two things, the relationship between the stones and high technology, and also that of the world we live in today. Total corporate ownership run by corporate technocrats. The rise of transhumanism, both in terms of cold-blooded war robots, killing robots, and also sex robots, as well as the surveillance society with the CCTV cameras playing a pivotal part in creating the real sinister horror of the story. That the ancient technology of our ancestors should never fall into the hands of the psychopathic control grid.